Good afternoon. My name is Jim Carmichael, and I'm the prison minister here at the Park Church of Christ. It's great to be here with you, and may all honor and glory be God's that we are able to gather here today and worship Him in spirit and truth. Also, I would like to welcome you to the First Park Prison Ministry Worship Service, which is focused on the families of prisoners, former prisoners, and their families. And of course, also the prison ministry volunteers. You know, basically, we are all in this together. We, we also want to welcome anyone else who would like to attend. Uh, first, I would like to give um, a disclaimer. I had dental work performed this week and uh, it didn't go all that well. However, I came through it fine, uh, but my tongue still feels a little thick. So please bear with me. Uh, also, I, I normally try to keep sermons so, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1 Corinthians 1.23, which states, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and to the Greeks' foolishness. However, this afternoon, I decided to speak on hope. And if I were to give a title to the lesson, I believe it would be when Jesus comes knocking. One of the most important questions I learned to ask early in life is why. So I'm going to start the lesson with a couple of why questions. First, why would we do this? Why do we even have a prison ministry? So the primary reason is that we hope to help prisoners find their way to that narrow gate and that difficult path that leads to life. We also want to keep families together during this most difficult time of life when a family member has been removed from the home. Keep this in mind as we go through the lesson. God is our last hope. And he's our only hope. But God is our last hope because we are his first love. So never lose hope. Never give up. You know, there just might be a bigger issue at hand, a purpose that you're not aware of when a loved one is, has been taken into prison. A family member is still a family member, a loved one, even though they can't be present. We still love them. For example, a father is still a father and can still function as a father and family member even though he is incarcerated. There are many other examples of, of fathers and mothers both who can't be present on, in uh, the family unit on a daily basis. And you know, often they're gone for years, such as in the military during a time of war. That does not change their family status or their parental status, or how much we love them. It just takes on a different way of functioning, a new dynamic, so to speak. Another why question is why are these people incarcerated? And I know the first answer that comes to mind is they were convicted of a crime. We talk about this at uh, Dick Connors on a very regular basis. I tell the guys, because I want them to remember this, but I tell the guys that they're not here because they committed a crime. And of course, I understand that's the surface reason. But what if there's something deeper, something deeper than that? What if you or they are here by design for a purpose? When you see a man completely turn his life to God in prison, you realize God must have a hand in it. He has placed this person in a situation that allows him, God, to get this person's attention. Remember, it isn't man seeking God, it's God seeking man. Romans 3 verses 10 through 12, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, no, not one. 
Matthew 13, 45 and 46, there is a pearl of great price. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Think about it, who's the man? It's God. When you sell something, you are sacrificing that item for something else. That is a sacrifice. The message of the parable is that God sacrificed his son for this lost world. He paid the full price. There were no shortcuts, no discounts, no coupons. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Revelation 3, 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. So this afternoon, I'm going to share a few examples as a way to illustrate these verses that tells us God seeks us, and also offer them as evidence that there, there just might be more to a prison sentence than what meets the eye. There was a, a, a tinker. Now, this is an old term for blacksmith. But this t uh, tinker preached to a church that met in an old barn. The tinker was John Bunyan, Puritan pastor and author of Pilgrim's Progress. So I'll give you some facts about Bunyan. John Bunyan is the best known of the Puritans. He was the least educated Puritan. He fought in Oliver Cromwell's army in the English Civil War. Actually, we know almost nothing about his youth and childhood. We do know that he wrote over 60 books, mostly while he was in jail. But one book stands out. The Pilgrim's Progress has sold over 250 million copies. Let me compare that to Fox's Bear uh, Book of Martyrs. That was written in 1563. And it, you know, it sold over 150 million. But here's one that you'll recognize, The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. Written in 1954, I think we probably have all seen the movie that sold 150 million. The only Christian books that have outsold it are the Bible, The Imitation of Christ, and the Book of Common Prayer. You know, Pilgrim's Progress has been translated into over 200 languages and has never been on print. That is phenomenal, folks. It's beyond belief, really. But it's considered the first novel written in English. It is the first place bestseller, apart from the Bible, but in all publishing history. You know, when China's communist government printed Pilgrim's Progress as an example of Western cultural heritage, the initial printing was 200,000 copies. That should take, what, a couple of years at least to sell out? No, it sold out in three days. And remember, this guy had a second, maybe a third grade education, and while he was in prison, wrote the greatest Christian book outside of the Bible in all of history. Everyone in this room has experienced difficulties that led us into a dark place. But this is the mystery and the glory. For it is in that dark place is where we can best see the light. John 1, 4, in him was life and that life is the light of the world. It was 1945, World War II had drawn to a close, and a young man sat broken inside a POW camp. He had been a reluctant soldier in Hitler's army, and here, inside a prison in Scotland, he had months to contemplate what had been and what was to come. The cities of his homeland had been reduced to rubble, and the people were impoverished. I can only really imagine this, but you know, his sleep was filled with repeating nightmares in which the terrors of warfare were lived over and over. Try to think about that. 
how bad that war was as well, how bloody, how horrible it was. And then came what was for me the worst of all these things, he writes. September 1945, in Camp 22 in Scotland, we were confronted with pictures of Belson and Auschwitz. They were pinned up in one of the huts without comment. Slowly and relentlessly, the truth filtered in to our awareness, and we saw ourselves mirrored in the eyes of the Nazi victims. Was this what we had fought for? Had my generation, as the last, been driven to our deaths so that the concentration camp murderers could go on killing and Hitler could live a few months longer? The depression over the wartime destruction and a captivity without any apparent end was intensified by feelings of profound shame and having to share it in this disgrace with the others. And remember this, this was probably a very young man, maybe late teens at best. That was undoubtedly the hardest thing, a stranglehold that choked us, he wrote. An unshakable shame saturated his being, and the only future he could see stretching out before him was one that filled him with despair. We can only imagine. But now, for the rest of the story. Yet it was in the midst of this shame and despair that God found him. A visiting chaplain gave the soldier a Bible, and with little else to do, he began reading it. In the Psalms, he heard resounding voices, the agony of people who felt God had abandoned them. In the story of Christ crucified, he encountered a God who knew what it was to experience suffering, abandonment, and shame. Feeling utterly forsaken himself, the German soldier found a friend and the one who cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Tears my heart out, folks. In 1947, he was given permission to attend a Christian conference that brought together young people from, from across the globe, from all over the world. And part of that group were uh, people from du uh, Holland. And the Dutch participants asked to meet with the German uh, POWs who had fought in the Netherlands. The young soldier was one of these men who met with them. He went to the meeting full of fear, guilt, and shame, as we can only imagine. Feelings intensified as the Dutch Christians spoke of the pain Hitler and his allies had inflicted. And they spoke of the dread the Gestapo bred in their hearts, of the family and friends they had lost, of the disruption and damage to their communities, but came to offer forgiveness. He said it was completely unexpected. These Dutch Christians embodied the love the German soldier had read about in the story of Christ, and it turned his life upside down. He discovered despite all that had passed, God looked on us with shining eyes, the shining eyes of his eternal joy, and that there was hope for the future. And that German soldier was Jürgen Moltmann, who would go on to become one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century. Amazing. <laughs> but you know, years later, with the message of his of the loving, crucified God still forever printed on his heart, he penned these beautiful words. I quote, The ultimate reason for our hope is not to be found at all in what we want, wish for, and wait for. The ultimate reason is that we are wanted and wished for and waited for. Every prison in the world is asking, is there anything waiting for me? Is there a future or is this it? Is this the, the life from now on, lost and forgotten? Is that my life? When we base our hope or trust in the divine mystery, we feel deep down in our hearts there is someone who is waiting for us, who is hoping for us, who believes in us, 
We're waited for as a prodigal son and the parable is waited for by his father. We are accepted and received as a mother takes her children into her arms and comforts them. God is our last hope because we are God's first love. God separates his chosen people, not only in this fashion, but however it best suits his goal of reaching the individual. Abraham, he sent to a foreign country. Noah, he put on a boat with his family. Joseph, he, had, uh, he let him be sold into slavery by his own family and then into prison by a man he served faithfully, but that man believed in a lie. But he left that prison and became the greatest, one of the greatest leaders of Egypt. A great story, the mystery of God. There is another man who wrote from prison as well. A horrible murderer and persecutor of Christians. His name was Saul of Tarsus until Christ changed it to Paul, who from within prison walls wrote 13 or 14 books of the New Testament, almost, almost half of the New Testament, and four were written while he was in prison. God's word from a prison? Never give up hope. Visualize this in the theater of your mind. From within prison walls, God gave us the greatest Christian book ever written. One that has led thousands, if not millions, to Christian, uh, uh, Christians to eternal life. From within prison walls, God gave us one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, who led countless lives to glory. From within prison walls, God gave us his word, the scriptures for us to live by, scriptures that have led millions to salvation. The story of Jorgen Moltmann is being repeated in every prison all over the world to some extent. And there is another story being played out in every prison in the world, the story of the young Dutch Christians. 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are to take the love of God into the darkness of this lost world. This is our great commission. God separates his chosen people, not only in this fashion, but However, it best suits his goal of reaching the individual. Look at Abraham. He sent him to a foreign country. Noah, he put on a boat with his family. Joseph, he let him be sold into slavery and then into prison by a man he served faithfully, but who believed in a lie. But he left that prison and became the greatest leader, one of the greatest leaders of Egyptian history. A great story of the mystery of God. We never know what God can do. He can do anything. But there is another man who wrote from prison, a horrible murderer, or persecutor of Christians. And his name was Saul of Tarsus until Christ changed it to Paul, who from within prison walls wrote 13 or 14 books of the New Testament, almost half, and four of them were written while he was in prison. God's words coming from a prison who would ever thought, right? Visualize this. From within prison walls, God gave us the greatest Christian book ever written. One that's led thousands, if not millions, to Christ and to eternal life. And from within prison walls, God gave us one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century. Who had led countless lives to glory. And from prison walls, God gave us his word, the scriptures for us to live by, the scriptures that lead us to eternal life, scriptures that have led millions to salvation. The story of Jorgen Moltmann is being repeated in every prison all over the world today to some extent. There is another story being played out in every prison in the world the story of the young Dutch Christians. First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen generation. He's talking about you. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are to take the love of God into the darkness of the world. That is our great commission. And here's a freebie for you. When we look in John 1, 4, we find that Jesus gave life to the world and him was life. And that life was the light of the world. That light we're taking into the darkness, that's life. You are a privileged person when you can take the life and the light of God to one lost in the darkness. That Bible didn't get into Moltmann's hands by accident. It was placed there by a prison chaplain, maybe a volunteer. You might just be the person who makes it known to one living in darkness and despair, to one who has given up all hope, that there is hope, that he has not forgotten, but wanted, wished for, and waited for. You can be like one of those young Dutch Christians who demonstrate the love of God in real life. You can be like the chaplain who places a Bible in the hands of the next great evangelist or theologian. Matthew 25, 31 to 40, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will answer and say to them, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Let's close with a, a question that comes from a sermon by E.V. Hill, the great preacher from Los Angeles, who is reckoned to have fed over a million people during his lifetime as the pastor of the downtown Los Angeles mission. He asked, when was God at his greatest? I'm going to tell you, he is at his greatest every time a prisoner falls to the floor and cries out in his shame and grief and despair, dear Lord, save me. When he brings a lost and separate family back together and they answer when Jesus comes knocking at the door of their heart. And once again, they live as a family with Christ in the center. That is when he is at his greatest. God is our last hope. That's all the hope we'll ever need. And we will only just answer when Jesus comes knocking. So I thank you for your time and the lesson is yours.